Thanks. How are you all this evening? I'm okay. You're probably thinking, has he gone nuts? <laughs> and uh, does he know how to spell? I assure you there's nothing wrong with the spelling. So let's dive into this one and see where we end up. Well, what does this mean, the beamable, sustainable princess? Not princess, princess. Well, I'll leave it to your imagination as we go through the seminar to see what this exactly entails. And what has the Prince of Wales got to do with anything? This comes straight off his web page. He is beaming there, isn't he? Yes, he is beaming. But maybe he can even be beamable, who knows? Is Prince Charles the Antichrist? <laughs> you will find if you browse the web pages, web page after web page, book upon book upon book, that he is the Antichrist. Yes, you will find lots of literature if you browse it. They will claim his name comes to 60, 666 if you calculate it. They will give all these informative informations about why he is the Antichrist. And uh, this is one web page that talks about him. And it mentions the news brief, Wing Prince is Savior of the World. Fox News Life March 7, 2002. London, the Prince of Wales is to be immortalized in a bronze, as a bronze muscular winged god dressed in nothing more than a loincloth. He will be the first living member of the royal family to have a life-size statue dedicated in his honor. Although the prince is destined to become defender of the faith when he becomes king of England, the inscription on the statue in Brazil will honor him as Savior of the world. Hmm. I guess this is a play upon his environmental impact. When he talks about the environment and uh, the Rio conference which took place where he played a very prominent role and that is why they are terming him such. But... Of course, those who like to speculate grab hold of these things and say he is the man behind the scenes. He's the one who's being groomed as uh, the final antichrist. If you know your Bible, then you will not fall into that trap, right? But that doesn't mean that it isn't interesting. Everything in the world is interesting. And I've discovered something in my life. I used to hate history when I was a kid at school. I couldn't stand history. And then when I discovered truth and all of these things, history suddenly exploded. And it became so interesting. And I became interested in archaeology and I became interested in the sands of time and all of these issues. And history is more amazing than fiction. Much more amazing. Unfortunately, we don't always hear the right history. And often history is rewritten to suit the times we live in. And uh, in my own country, there are totally new history books and curriculums now than there were before. And the role players seem to have gone topsy-turvy. Those that were on top are now at the bottom. Those that were at the bottom are now on top. So history is very subjective. It depends on how you look at it. So Prince Charles, what can you tell us? And where do you fit into the picture? And if you do fit, fit into the picture, does it matter at all? What does the Bible say? Who is the Antichrist? Well, the Reformers were all unanimous that the criteria in Daniel could
could only fit the papacy and no one else. The correlations are so numerous, they said, so precise. And if you remember their words, fitting like Chubb's key into one of Chubb's locks. So that only that system could qualify for all the features listed in the book of Daniel, in the prophecies of Paul, and in the prophecies of the Revelation. So that was the Antichrist. And unfortunately, Prince Charles just doesn't qualify. There is no way that he ruled for 1,260 years. He's too young for that, isn't he? <laughs> and there's no way that he changed God's law. And all of these issues, he just doesn't fit the picture. But that doesn't mean he doesn't have a role to play as a very prominent royal member. Well, here is his webpage. And he is the founder of the International Business Leader Forum. And there's a webpage, you can go and look at it. And it says over there, the International Business Leaders Forum puts business at the heart of sustainable development. Key number one to the title. So he's a prince for sustainable development. And here are the IBLF's global footprint. This interactive map catalogues the global work and influence of the IBLF since its creation in 1990. Founded by His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales, we are an independent, not-for-profit organization currently supported by over 100 of the world's leading businesses. It's quite impressive. They're virtually active in every country in the world. And there is the big global footprint map. You will see they are active in the United States. They are active in Canada. And all the other countries have the dot in them. So he's a highly, highly influential man behind the scenes. Correlating and being the chairman of all of these mega business conglomerates. You know, he who swings the axe in those circles has a lot of clout. So don't underestimate the power of the man. He is the chairman of those boards. The Prince of Wales Business Leaders Forum, what does it tell us about him? In 1990, organizational meeting in Charleston was called Stakeholders, the challenge in a global market. And there were 100 CEOs from major multinational organizations that attended. The mission of the Prince of Wales Business Leader Forum is to promote continuous improvement in the practice of good corporate citizenship and sustainable development internationally as a natural part of the successful business operations. The term sustainable development is in vogue these days. It's being used everywhere. And it's actually a code word for something very different. It aims to work with members and partners to, number one, demonstrate that business has an essential and creative role to play in the prosperity of local communities as partners in development, particularly particularly in economies in transition. Business, government, community in partnership. To raise awareness for the values of the corporate responsibility in international business practice. Encourage partnership between business, communities as an effective means of promoting sustainable economic development. Doesn't that sound nice? Sounds very nice. The Prince of Wales Business Leaders Forum operates in 26 countries, concentrating on post-communist countries and developing economies, and they are active in every single nation. Fascinating. So you're very powerful. Now what does that mean? Business, government, in partnership, 
with the community. Hmm. What is fascism? Through public-private partnerships, the balance of power shifts from the people to the partner who has the most money. As the power shifts to the deepest pockets, that's the corporation, we have then moved into fascism. Rule by big reinvented government and big business. One, the downsizing of federal government in order to fit into the future global governance. And secondly, the government's shift to privatization of public services through public-private partnerships. Have you noticed that mayors, the mayor of a city, mayors have become more and more and more prominent in the world today? Have you noticed that? In the old days you never bothered about what the mayor did. But today you hear the mayor of New York, the mayor of this, the mayor of that. They're all very, very prominent people with legislative clout. And we in our country where I come from, are seeing business and government in partnership with the community. More and more and more and more. And what it basically means is that if we want new roads to uplift the community, well then government goes into partnership with business and employs the downtrodden community in this new venture and every road becomes a toll road. The community works and the community gets the privilege of having to pay extra for every kilometer they drive on that road. What a privilege! I'm so grateful when I travel on our new roads, spanking new, and I have to fork out 50 South African bucks every time I go around a corner. I might as well walk. <laughs> Fascism and the empowerment of corporations. Fascism. The term comes from the Latin fasces, meaning a bundle of rods with an axe. The symbol of state power carried ahead of the consul in ancient Rome. In fact, the ancient Roman consul would walk onto the top of the Capitol. And he would put his standard there, and if the people bowed down to him and accepted his authority, then he placed the fasciae on his standard. Wow. Fascinating. Do we have capitals outside of Rome today? Do we have capitol buildings? Do we have capitol hills? Just a question. Fascism began, modern fascism that is, March 23, 1990, under the leader, 1919, under the leadership of Mussolini. Mussolini was funded primarily by business groups and individuals such as Cornelius van der Bult. He was also supported by American bankers and during the World War II, the three countries with fascist governments were, as you know, Italy, Germany and Japan, allies of each other. These same countries are current members of the Group of Seven, says Bertram Gross. So these countries have mega cloud. But they're defeated countries, aren't they? They're defeated countries. It's amazing how the countries that lost the war became the economic hub of the world. Isn't that incredible? The word sustainable represents control. If everything has to be sustainable, then every aspect must be controlled. So every area is supposed to be uplifted. The community is supposed to benefit. You're going to get a new sewerage system in the community. Government, business is going to go into partnership on behalf of the community. And this beautiful facility will be built with much fanfare. And your pocket will be emptied more because now you have to pay an extra levy to make it viable. That's the benefit that you get. We need a new sense of responsibility for a new century. This is Bill Clinton's speech in 1997, his inaugural address. Listen to the buzzwords. 
We need a new sense of responsibility for a new century. With a new vision of government, a new sense of responsibility, a new spirit of community, we will sustain America's journey, the promise we sought in a new land, we will find in a land of new promise. Isn't that fascinating? <laughs> when I came to America the first time many, many years ago, what was that hit song? I think it was Neil Diamond. We're coming to America. Do you remember that? Man, they pumped it out. Everybody wanted to come to America. And now nobody wants to go to America. They're dead scared to go through the border. It's incredible. Here I am, a pretty nice citizen, I thought. And I went down to do a lecture series down there in the south of America, near New Orleans. And I saw the Mississippi for the first time. How exciting. And here was a Mississippi steamer. Ooh, what will a tourist do when he sees that? He'll pull out his camera and he'll take a picture. I'd just taken the picture when this police car rolled up next to me. Spread them! What you doing? I'm taking a picture uh, of the Mississippi. <laughs> Why are you taking a picture of the Mississippi? Um, because it's there? <laughs> Half an hour. The same question, over and over and over again. I thought I was going nuts. He said, well, why are you taking a picture? Then it changed to, why are you taking a picture of the Mississippi? I said, because I'm a tourist. My wife is not here. I want to show her the Mississippi. He went through everything I had on me. He went through my my papers. He put me through the computer and I stood there for an hour until my friend came and rescued me and said, what's going on here? Why are you keeping this man? He took a picture of the Mississippi. Man, I'll be careful if I take a picture of the Mississippi again. I'll first look around and see what's going on. Well, here we are. We have a new the promise we sought in a new land, we will find again in a land of new promise. It's going to be a sustainable world. It will be magnificent. Where does the philosophy come from and what does it mean? Well, let's go to the Soviet Constitution of 1977. It reads, In the interests of the present and future generations, the necessary steps are taken in the USSR to protect and make scientific rational use of the land and its mineral and water resources, and the plant and animal kingdoms to preserve the purity of air and water, ensure reproduction of natural wealth, and improve the human environment. Fascinating. They were the champions of clean air, weren't they, in the USSR? Have you ever been there? <laughs> wow, you must see the smokestacks. In the executive sum summary of the book, Business as Partners in Development, Creating Wealth for Countries, Companies and Communities, the authors write, In most cases, the debate is no longer about extreme alternatives, about communism versus capitalism, the free market versus state control, democracy versus dictatorship, but about finding common good. This new watchword of a world in distress and sustainable development is the new word, word for gaining control over every single aspect of humanity, including the governments and the individuals. Here are the Knights of Columbus, this Catholic organization that George Bush spoke to and praised so profusely. Look at their symbol. There it is. The fasciae. Fascinating. They are, of course, a Catholic organization pushing for Catholic governance in the United States of America. And uh, if we read over here, for today Rome considers the fascist regime as the nearest to its dogmas and interests. 
We have not merely the reverend Jesuit father Coughlin praising Mussolini's Italy as a Christian democracy, but Civilta Cattolica, which is the official mouthpiece of the Jesuits, by the way, saying quite frankly, quote, Fascism is the regime that corresponds most closely to the concepts of the Church of Rome. So that's what Rome wants. And sustainable development, which requires government and business in partnership with the community, is fascism. What do you own under fascism? Nothing. You're called a partner. But partner just is a new word for slave. That's all it is. Because you own nothing, you may work in the process, and you may pay for the benefit. <laughs> what is that other than being controlled by a new feudal system? Now let's have a look at the religion and the Prince of Wales. This comes from the book Prince Charles, the Sustainable Prince. It's quite an interesting book. Not happy with the Christian faith, according to his biographers, he began a tentative inquiry into the field of what its practitioners referred to as psychical research, or parapsychology, and which its adversaries ridiculed as dabbling in the occult. Well, he's well known to have said that he has regular conversations with uh, Lord Mountbatten, who is no longer with us. So he must be dealing with some of these issues. In the mid-70s, South African-born writer, you know, these South Africans, they're everywhere. I wish, you know, <laughs> they wouldn't be so problematic. But anyway, this South African writer, explorer, and mystic, Lawrence van der Post, became a spiritual counselor to Charles. It was van der Post who helped him explore the natural world as well as the inner world where the outer depends on the inner. He went on to study Buddhism and Hinduism, the convictions that Charles began to form, what he was soon to say about alternative medicine, architecture, the environment, sprang from a spiritual feeling for the mystical in mankind. That's interesting. He was also very interested in what is called the Gaia hypothesis. Charles was greatly influenced by James Lovelock, who formulated the Gaia hypothesis which today is known as the worship of the earth. Another way to understand holism is to realize that it perverts and inverts Genesis 1. We spoke about that last night. Where he is equal, the human being, with the earth, the plants and the animals. It's a form of pantheism. It means man evolves. Holism is evolution at its finest. Charles elevates the position of the environment to one of dominance over man. Charles maintains that the environment is key to changing society. So there are many people looking at what he's doing and that's where they're getting all these ideas from. But uh, is it really he or is a smoke screen? Well, let's have a look at the news. This is the BBC News in 2006. They called Charles a modern prince. Isn't that nice of them? He takes a keen interest in architecture, young people, the environment and health. Supports organic farming as far back as 1984. Is there anything wrong with any of those issues? Absolutely not. Long before it became a mass consumer issue and his vociferous beliefs in, in conservation has often been ahead of his time. The prince's view that when, listen carefully, the prince's view that when king he might change his title of defender of the faith to defender of faith to reflect multicultural modern Britain cheered many. So this modern prince doesn't want to be defender of the faith which is linked to Christianity alone but he wants to be defender of faith. So Prince Charles recognizes the multicultural nature of modern Britain. Now my question is this. The Vatican and Great Britain, are they at loggerheads? Now, it's interesting that there are only two surviving 
ancient monarchies. There are many monarchies, but the two oldest ones that can take their lineage all the way back happen to be Rome and Great Britain. Let's read. The only two people in the world who share the same status, power, please note that this person is saying same, but we'll see whether that is so. The same status, power and position are the Pope and the Queen. The Papal See is considered the world's oldest authority on royalty. The Almanac de Gotha, which is that, that's the most revered mouthpiece for who is royalty in the world, the Almanac de Gotha, says they are the oldest monarchy in the world. So the Papacy is the oldest continuous monarchy in the world. Therefore, that makes the Pope a king, with the cardinals of the church considered to be equal to the sons of kings. The heads of a world religion, the ruler of a recognized country, the Vatican, and the Queen comes from this world's second oldest monarchy. She is the head of the Anglican Church and is the ruler of Britain. As her titles show that the army, navy and air force of the United Kingdom report to her. They are literally Her Majesty's Army, Her Majesty's Navy, Her Majesty's Air Force. And in your country, Her Majesty's Canada, right? Look on your notes and you will see her there. So, she is a very important person. And she must be a prominent ruler to take into account, or is it so? Today I want to discuss history with you. And when we've discussed history, we'll go to the future. We'll come to our present time. I call this the battle over Britain. You know the battle of Britain, don't you? But this is somewhat different. This is the battle over Britain. And I want to start this battle when Britain was squarely in the Roman Catholic camp. And a king was ruling, and the dates are over there. He ruled as king, 1154 to 1189. As king of England, he was also king of Scotland. And his name was Henry II. And there he is. And this is where history gets a twist. Fascinating twist. Now let's jump to a somewhat more modern time. 2nd of February 2005, that's when the Pope died. And the newspapers in the world recorded his great activities. And in England, they remembered the prayers as the Pope visited the UK in 1982. A memorable moment when the Pope climbed off his aeroplane in his customary way, he kissed the ground, showing that the territory was whose? His. Now it's always interesting to watch what these globalists are doing. And in the afternoon, a crowd of 80,000 gathered for Mass at the Wembley Stadium in what was billed as the first of the Pope's outdoor spectaculars. They sung... Careful note of what they had to sing. He's got the whole world in his hands. And they clapped their hands as he arrived in his Pope mobile. He has the whole world in his hands. That's what he sang. This was the first visit of a Pope to that nation in centuries. Now, what else did he do? The Pope met with Prince Charles and the Archbishop of Canterbury. Now the Archbishop of Canterbury is apparently subject to whom? To the Queen! Because she is the head of the Anglican Church. Following the death of the Pope, people in Kent have been remembering his historic visit to Canterbury in 1982. John Paul II became the first pontiff ever to visit the UK when he made the six-day tour of the country. Fascinating. First one, and he stayed six days. How many days? Six. 
He visited Canterbury Cathedral on the 29th of May to say prayer with the then Archbishop of Canterbury, who happened to be Robert Runcie. There he is in the picture. Streets were lined by 25,000 people and the Pope told the congregation it was a day which centuries and generations have awaited. Wow, this is fascinating stuff. Fascinating stuff. Now let's go back to a little bit of history and note what the Pope did. This is the BBC News, Saturday the 2nd, 2005. The BBC reports, The Pope and Dr. Runcy knelt in silent prayer at the place of the martyrdom, the spot where Sir Thomas A. Beckett was murdered in 1170. Now remember that nothing that they do is without purpose. And here the Archbishop and the Pope go and they kneel down there where all those centuries ago Thomas Beckett had been murdered. Hmm. Here is a relief of Thomas Beckett's murder and you have the four knights who overheard Henry II talking about this pestilent monk and they thought to do the king a favor by getting rid of him and they murdered him. And uh, the honorary canon of the cathedral when the Pope was there said, quote, It was a very moving moment to see the Pope and the Archbishop of Canterbury praying in the very spot where the most famous of all archbishops, Thomas A. Beckett, had fallen so many centuries ago. I would beg to differ on that point. But... Uh, who am I if I favor Cranmer over this gentleman? But nevertheless, he was here, according to them, the most famous archbishop that Canterbury ever saw. Now, why did the Pope kneel there? Why was it significant that he said, centuries have waited, has the whole world in his hand? Why was this significant? What happened all those centuries ago in the time of Henry II. Why was Archbishop Beckett murdered? Well, let's read about it. In the tradition of Norman kings, Henry II was keen to dominate the church like the state. Here was a king, he said, I'm boss of my own country and you church will listen to me. At Clarendon Palace on the 30th of January 1164, the king set out 16 constitutions aimed at decreasing ecclesiastical interference from Rome. Rome, you take second place in my country, I'm first. Do you do that to Rome and get away with it? But the newly appointed Archbishop of Canterbury refused to ratify the proposals. Henry was characteristically stubborn and on the 8th of October 1164 he called the Archbishop Thomas Beckett before a royal council. The Archbishop knew what was coming so he fled. He fled to France and there he was under the protection of Henry's rival Louis VII of France. In 1170, the Pope was considering excommunicating all of Britain, only Henry's agreement that Becket could return to England without penalty prevented this fate. So here was a war between church and state. Thomas A. Becket was murdered in 1170. The king was angry that he had to give in to this pressure, and he made these remarks about this pestilent monk. And his knights went and solved his problem. Actually, they created a big problem. History is fascinating. You know, there's an old saying which says, Rome never forgets. Well, Henry's knights wanted to do the king a favor. Just three years later, Becker was canonized and revered as a martyr. It took three years and he was a martyr against secular interference in God's church. Now you can understand why the Pope knelt there. Centuries later, Pope Alexander III had declared Thomas Becket a saint. 
And historian John Harvey believes it was yet another failure in Henry's religious policy, an arena which he seemed to lack adequate subtlety. And politically, Henry had to sign the Compromise of Avranche, which removed from the secular courts almost all jurisdiction over the clergy. So the king had to sign that he had no rights to control the clergy. This compromise in 1172 marked the reconciliation of Henry of II of England with the Catholic Church after the murder of Thomas Becket. Henry was purged of any guilt in Becket's murder, but he agreed that the secular courts had no jurisdiction over the clergy with the exception of high treason, highway robbery and arson. Fascinating. Now what's even more interesting, he had to be punished. Now who is higher? The one who is punishing or the one who is being punished? Well, let's look at history. The murder had far-reaching consequences for England, but the immediate result was that Henry II had to make peace with the church. He did this four years later by performing penance at Canterbury Cathedral. He was beaten by 80 monks while wearing sackcloths and ashes. There is the picture. There's the poor king. Here are the monks beating the king. Now what's a king? Hmm. And spent the night in vigil at St. Thomas Becket's tomb. The church had wasted no time and had canonized Becket. He also had to promise to raise money for the crusades and to either mount a crusade or make a pilgrimage. He did neither. There was enough to do at home. So he was in trouble. This king was in trouble and he was severely reprimanded and he got the hiding of his life. Fine. Now let's go a little bit further into history. Just, just a couple of years. Now England was pretty humiliated. Can you imagine how they felt? Their king was beaten <laughs> up by monks and uh, they had to pay all this money supposedly. Well, King John's concession of England and Ireland. Now King John is very famous. There he is, King 1167 to 1216. In the matter of the election and installation of Stephen Langton as Archbishop of Canterbury, King John, in the words of Pope Innocent III, had by impious persecution tried to enslave the entire English church. So here this next king comes and he says, I don't want that Archbishop, I want another one. And the Pope says, who do you think you are? I say what goes. Did we have a little altercation with China and the present Pope just recently? Oh, it was very interesting. You don't tell the Pope who's boss. And he said, King, you will listen to me. You will appoint the one I want. Hmm. As a result, the Pope laid on England an interdict, 1208 to 14. A sort of religious strike wherein no religious service was to be performed for anyone guilty or innocent. When, that didn't, when this didn't work, the king himself was excommunicated. Now you must remember how afraid those people were. If you weren't with the church, you were lost forever. The people were fear struck. The king had been excommunicated. Caving in under that pressure, John wrote a letter of concession to the Pope, hoping to have the interdict and the excommunication lifted. The year was 1213. John's concession, which in effect made England a fiefdom of Rome. Please note where I've taken this from. This comes from sources of British history. So England became a fiefdom to Rome, worked like a charm. The satisfied Pope lifted the yoke he had hung on the people of England and their king. But that wasn't enough. King, put it there. Put it there. So the king went and he signed a declaration and he relinquished the crown, there is the picture, of the crown being placed at the feet of the Roman prelate. The crown of England, Rome is yours. 
And I will rent it back at a fee. Fascinating history. This is mind-boggling. Nobody even thinks about it today. Let's carry on. Now, this is the concession he signed. And I'm going to bore you by actually reading it. Because you cannot get more interesting history today than that. This is the medieval source book, John the First's Concession of England to the Pope. This is what he said. John, by the grace of God, King of England, Lord of Ireland, Duke of Normandy, etc., etc., to all the faithful of Christ who shall look upon this present charter, greetings. We wish it to be known to all, through this our charter, notice the words, charter, furnished with our seal, that inasmuch as we have offended in many ways God and our mother, the Holy Church, and in consequence are known to have very much needed the divine mercy and cannot offer anything worthy for making due satisfaction to God and to the Church unless we humiliate ourselves and our kingdom. We wishing to humiliate ourselves for him who hum humiliated himself for us unto death, the grace of the Holy Spirit inspiring, not induced by force or compelled by fear, but of our good, own good and spontaneous will and by the common counsel of our barons do offer and freely concede to God and his holy apostles Peter and Paul and to our mother the holy Roman church and to our Lord Pope Innocent and his Catholic successors the whole kingdom of England, the whole kingdom of Ireland with all their rights and opportunities. So any future gain of that kingdom is conceded to whom? To the Pope. For the remission of our own sins and those of our whole race as well for the living and for the dead. Now receiving and holding them as it were as vassals. What is a vassal? One who serves. From God and the Roman Church in the presence of that prudent man, Paul the subdeacon of the household of the Lord Pope, we perform and swear fealty. That means subservience. We swear fealty. To them, to him, our aforesaid Lord Pope Innocent and his Catholic successors in the Roman Church. According to the form apprehended and the presence of the Lord Pope, if we shall be able to come before him, we shall do liege homage. Wow! We are merely vassals to the Pope. Binding our successors and our heirs by our wife forever. In similar manner, to perform fealty and show homage to him who shall be chief pontiff at that time. Who is it today? Benedict. Well, here's an interesting document. And to the Roman church without demur. That's it. Done deal. As a sign, moreover, of this our own, we will and establish perpetual obligation and concession forever. We will establish that from the proper and special revenues of our set kingdom, and then he talks about how much money he's going to have to pay for renting back the privilege of the crown from the real owner who is now who? who is the Pope, who becomes the land lord. The word land lord comes from the land lord. Now when you are a land lord, you receive rent and for that you get certain privileges. So here is what they had to pay. We shall receive yearly a thousand marks sterling, namely at the Feast of St. Michael, etc., and then all these other fees that they had to pay, saving to us and to our heirs our right, liberties, and regalia. So our crown, our pomp, our glory, we have rented back from the Pope for this fee. We bind ourselves and our successors not to act counter to them. 
And now look carefully. If we or any one of our successors shall presume to attempt this, whosoever he be, unless being duly warned he come to his kingdom and his senses, he shall lose his right to the kingdom, and this charter of our obligation and concession shall always remain firm. So if we break this agreement, we lose the crown forever. Wow. What happened? I'm excited. I want to know. I hope you are. Where did the king sign this? Now please note this. The plot thickens. This comes from the select historical documents of the Middle Ages. I, myself, this is the king, bearing witness in the house of the Knights Templars near Dover, in the presence of Marcher, Master Archbishop of Dublin, Master J. Bishop of Norwich, and then he goes through the whole list of who there was present. And he put his signature to it. So the crown belongs to Rome, but the king rented it back. Now, did they ever break the agreement? Well, that was a lot of money. A thousand pound ach, mark sterling, plus the other fees that had to be paid, plus the Peter's penny that had to be paid. Britain groaned under this king. This is where the legends come in of uh, the time of Robin Hood and all of those. Although history has been distorted there. The timing is wrong, but the event is interesting. Well, King John caved under the pressure of his barons who couldn't afford the taxes. And so he signed the Magna Carta on June 15, 1215. And the Magna Carta is a famous document. And in this document, he promised to pay respect to what the barons and the lords of the empire said, more so than what someone else said. And so they refused from then on to pay the thousand marks sterling. What did they do when they refused to pay that? They broke the agreement. King John broke the terms of this charter by signing the Magna Carta in June 15, 1215. Remember the penalty for breaking it was the loss of the crown, the right to the kingdom, to the Pope and the Roman Church. It says so quite plainly, to formally and lawfully take the crown from the royal monarch in England by an act of declaration on the August 24, 1215. Pope Innocent annulled the Magna Carta Later in the year, he placed an interdict prohibition on the entire British Empire and from that time until today, the English monarchy and the entire British crown belong legally to the Pope. Now, England wasn't always very good to the Pope. And there were things like reformations. And King Henry, who said, blow the Pope, I don't care about him, he had other interests. His was more a uh, androgenic problem than anything else. Well, let's not go into the details of that. Here is the picture of the king signing the Magna Carta, breaking the agreement. Only three of the original clauses on the Magna Carta are still law. All the rest has been rescinded today. Please note what is still law. So, this portion is still okay. One defends the freedom and the rights of the English church. Another confirms the liberties and customs of London and the other towns. But the third is the most famous. No free man shall be seized or imprisoned or stripped of his rights or possessions or outlawed or exiled. Nor will we proceed with force against him except by the lawful judgment of his equals or by the law of the land. To no one will we sell, to, do, to no one deny or delay right of justice. It has resonant echoes in the American Bill of Rights and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Everything else has been rescinded. So Rome really owns the kingdom. Theirs is the crown. 
And for the monarchs today to have the crown is actually a pretense. The Templars own the crown. Now who are the modern Templars? Who are the modern Templars? That is the question. The Templars have disappeared. Now if you, I'm not going to go through my previous lectures where we talk about all the secret societies. You can get them on the DVDs, but I'll just give you a little clue. Here are the Knights Templars. Please note their regalia. Here is a Templar. This is the Templar robe. Notice that he has the sash on the left side with the Templar cross on it. Their main symbol is of course the crown with the cross. They have united the power of regalia of kings with that of the cross. And they are in control. They control the kings through the Knights Templars. All the Knights Templars successors. Now who were the successors? Please note the robe. Look at it carefully. And then let's go to the Catholic Encyclopedia. This comes from the Catholic Encyclopedia here. Is this the same looking robe? Yes or no? Hospitalers of St. John of Jerusalem, also known as the Knights of Malta. The most important of all the military orders, both of the extent of its area and for its duration. It is said to have existed before the Crusades and is not extinct at the present time. Now the Knights of Malta, of course, are in cohesion and collusion with the Jesuits. And there were even wars between Jesuits and the Knights of Malta. And the Jesuits, the Black Pope, is actually the controlling power behind the whole scene. But each of these orders are subservient to him. Now, there are Protestant groups today that are pretended Protestant groups but are actually Knights of Malta. Now, I wonder who would wear a similar robe to that. Being subservient only to the Pope. Because the Knights of Malta are a military papal order. Oh, fascinating. And there we have our Queen. And she has the regalia of the hospitalers. Now, it's claimed to be the Protestant version. So the Queen meets volunteers from St. John's Ambulance. Her Majesty is Sovereign of the Order of St. John. The emblem of the Order of St. John, the English Protestant ecumenical branch of the Order of Malta, which is a Catholic secret society. Now let's have a look at the Knights of Malta. Here we have the Pope, the present Pope, and the High Commander, the Master of the Order of Malta. He happened to die this year. But Benedict greets the Grand Master of the Order of Malta, Prince Andrew Willoughby Ninian Bertie in the Vatican. Notice that the Prince is subservient to the Pope. And he is the Grand Master. Every Knight of Malta is subservient to him. So who's the Queen subservient to? Must be subservient to him, who is in turn subservient to the Pope. Now, uh, Prince Andrew, Willoughby Ninian, died in 2008, this very year. And the next one to be appointed is the new Grand Master, Rome, 11th April 2008, the recently elected Grand Master of the Order of Malta, His Most Eminent Highness, Matthew Festing was received this morning in private audience by His Holiness Pope Benedict. It's interesting that this is a British Grand Master. And if you are a Grand Master in the Knights of Malta, you have to be royalty. You must have a royal title. You must be king. You must be royal. So this man is royalty subject to Rome. Now there are certain orders in Britain and all of these form different levels of this secret hierarchy which is by law under the Roman papacy. Now of course the Reformation disturbed this for a long time but the Pope's visit was fascinating. Where did he kneel? At the place where the conflict 
with Britain started. At the place where Thomas Beckett was murdered. When a king decided to suppress the Roman Catholic Church. And the outcome of that was the signing of a document which eventually gave Rome the crown. So when we talk of the crown, it is a ruse to think that the queen has the crown. It is the crown of the Knights Templars. And the knights do homage to the crown. They're not doing homage to the queen. They're doing homage to the Templars and they're doing homage to the Pope. This is the most noble order of the garter. The queen is sovereign of this order. Five members of the royal family are ladies of the order or royal knights and there are 24 knights and lady companions. And uh, there are three ex-prime ministers, foreign monarchs are present, extra knights, companions and ladies. This is the inner council that has to do with the affairs of state. And here is the full picture of all the knights of the garter and uh, I had a fascinating life myself I actually had dinner once, excuse me with one of these uh, lordly gentlemen and there he is sitting in the middle row, Lord Sainsbury I had dinner with him one evening at the British consulate in South Africa and uh, he was, came up to investigate our scientific research because I was a Royal Society uh, grant holder. And so I actually didn't know that he was a member of the Garter, but I'm happy to see that he was. Well, the development of Prince Charles. Prince Charles was born Charles Philip Arthur George Mountbatten, Windsor, in 1948, the same year that Israel was birthed. In 1969, his mother made him Prince of Wales. And he became a Knight of the Garter. And he's also the great master and principal Knight Grand Cross of the Most Honourable Order of the Bath. Strange names, eh? It is the Order of the Bath into which President Ronald Reagan and George Bush were knighted after each left office. Very interesting. Here is a military order and it is given to presidents of the United States. Fascinating. Why order of the bath? Because anciently they used to bathe themselves as a spiritual cleansing. It was of the religious aspect of the order. It had a spiritual connotation. Hmm. Here the queen places the crown on the head of Bonnie Prince Charles in 1969 when he became the Prince of Wales. It's interesting that the Prince of Wales coat of, coat of arms is not part of the Queen's. So the Prince is a sovereign. He has a throne. He's not waiting for one. He's the Prince of Wales. And uh, he's also the Grand Master of the Order of the Bath. And when he was crowned, this is what Queen Elizabeth II said. These are the words. This dragon, because that's the emblem that they chose for Wales, this dragon gives you your power, your throne, and your own authority. His response to her was, I am now your liege man and worthy of your earthly worship. Liege is an old English word meaning Lord. I am now your Lord man and worthy of your earthly worship. Now what does all of this mean? Isn't it interesting? I hope you're interested. Who's the dragon? Did you know that the dragon was the symbol of Rome? It was the symbol of ancient Rome? You'll find it under the ancient Roman bridges. There was always a dragon. And it is part of the Vatican crest. And if you read your book of Revelation in the Bible, then you will see in Revelation chapter 12 that the dragon is a symbol of Satan, but it is also the symbol of Rome whom Satan used to attack God's people and the Messiah himself. And if you read in Revelation chapter 13, it is the dragon that gives 
the beast of Revelation 13, his power and great authority. So Satan and Rome, working in unison, have this authority. And the prince, well, who are you subject to, prince? Well, what's in the name? Do you know, Pope Benedict, they made a big deal when they chose his name. Do you remember that? And there was a lot of writing about the importance of the name because the name stands for something. So I'm briefly going to go through this history and then we'll have a short break. Charles I of England. Let's just go through these names. Charles famously engaged in a struggle for power with Parliament over England. Now please look at the date. 1625 to 1649. So here... Rome was firm, firmly in control. They had the crown. They had the power. They controlled the kings of England. And then something terrible happened in history. The Reformation came. And Rome lost that power. Not legally, but by force of power. The Reformation threw Rome out. Do you think Rome was going to relinquish that crown? And so the battle over Britain began. The Reformation came in between and there were battles and rivers of blood. And Queen Elizabeth I became this powerful Protestant monarch who overshadowed Europe and made the Bible available to the whole world as a consequence of her actions. Prior to her, they murdered the monarchs and Queen Bloody Mary, Queen Mary, slaughtered the Protestants and then the Protestants took hold. They were sick to death of all the bloodshed. And Rome tried to get control of the kings. King Charles, famously engaged in a struggle for power with Parliament over England, he was an advocate of the divine right of kings and many subjects of England feared that he was attempting to gain absolute power. And he wanted to enforce his power. Religious conflict permeated Charles's reign. He married a Catholic princess, Henrietta Maria of France. So he had Catholic connections. Over objections of parliament and public opinion, he further allied himself with the controversial religious figures, including all of these Catholic-centered prelates. And so the Parliament of England and the Church of England thought he was too close to Roman Catholicism. Charles's later attempt to force religious reform upon Scotland led to the bishops' wars. Then he had wars with the covenanters of Scotland who said, no, no way will I do this. And eventually the outcome of the matter was he was executed. So here was the first king who again said, let's get back to Catholicism. Let's suppress the Protestant churches. He appointed bishops that he wanted in Scotland. The wars came out. It was bloodshed over the country. So here was a Charles who stood up for Catholicism. He paid the price. Cromwell came afterwards. England was ruled by the Puritans and Cromwell. And then came another Charles. Charles II. Charles attempted to introduce religious freedom for Catholics and Protestants and dissenters. But the English Parliament forced him to withdraw it. And in 1679, Totus Out Revelation supposed the Popish plot sparked the exclusion crisis when it was revealed that Charles's brother and heir was a Roman Catholic. So here was another one who said, I'm very Catholic inclined. And look what he's wearing. He's wearing the robes of the Order of the Garter. There's the blue sash of the Order of the Garter. Isn't this fascinating history? The exclusion bill sought to exclude the king's brother and heir. And he was Catholic, so they didn't want a Catholic monarch. They said the monarch had to be Protestant. Is Rome going to be happy with that? Certainly not. But here's the interesting story. From popery came the notion of a standing army and arbitrary power. Formerly the crown of Spain and now France supports the roots of popery amongst us. But lay popery flat and there's an end to arbitrary government and power. It is a chimera, a notion without popery. 
And that king converted to Catholicism on his deathbed. Fascinating. So here were two Charleses that stood up against Protestantism for Catholicism. The one was executed. The next one became Catholic. I wonder what the third one's going to do. Is he going to follow Tony Blair perhaps? No, nah, I don't think he would go that far. He wants to be defender of the faith. And here is his coat of arms. And this is fascinating. And some people speculate about his coat of arms because it says at the bottom there in German, although some say it's a perversion of the Welsh, but never mind, it says, Ich dien, I serve. And there is his special little crown with the three feathers and it says, Ich dien. And then there's the red dragon. Could it mean I serve the red dragon? Is that possible? This is the red dragon on the flag of Wales. And some of the paraphernalia that go along with it has the motto, Yedre Goch Diriam, whatever that means. Meaning the red dragon gives the lead. And here it is in its original setting. And Her Majesty, the Queen of Elizabeth, approved the existing red dragon badge which was appointed as a royal badge and it says the red dragon gives the lead. Who's the red dragon? Have you got an idea who he is today? Could it be Rome and that all of these inner circle Knights Templars have a fascinating role to play? Is this possible? Bonnie Prince Charles and Bonnie Prince Andrew both Order of the Garter and Bonnie Prince William as he walks off Order of the Garter we don't have to read all of this here he was inaugurated and Order of the Bath well interesting you see we can get the Order of the Bath the Order consists of the Sovereign the, the Great Master who is the Prince of Wales three classes of members Knights, commanders, titles of the order, etc., 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 etc. And uh, here they are. Here he is in his regalia as Prince of Wales, dressed as the great master of the Order of the Bath and the Queen in her Order of the Bath regalia. And here is Bonnie Prince. Uh, no, no, no. Bonnie <laughs> Ronald. Bonnie Ronald, yes. Bonnie Ronald receiving the Order of the Bath, as did George Bush, and both were knighted to this office. Now you get this for service to the crown. Excuse me, who's the crown? Well, when we come back after a short break, we will get into this history, and then we will jump into modern times, and we will see where we are going with sustainable development. Have a short break.